various signs in regard to his second advent, which is at the end of the tribulational time period, when he comes back after that seven-year time period and establishes his millennial reign here on planet Earth. And there we're talking about the fifth sign, which it says now it will be like the days of Lot. So again, that's kind of a general statement. And then it goes on to saying that they will be eating and drinking, they will be building and planting, and they will be buying and selling. And in that, he also leaves off, they will be marrying and given in marriage. And the reason for that is because the days of Lot, we see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the three other major city states that were destroyed with it in that Jordan Valley. And we see that they were rampant with sin in their day. And their sin was, as we noted on Tuesday night, actually crying out to the Lord. The sin itself was crying out. Not that the people were, but the sin itself. And God heard that crying out of the sin and how egregious it was and the main sin that they were representing. Again, I'm sure they had multitudes of sins and immorality within their lives, but the main sin that they had was the sin of homosexuality. And that's what we note in Genesis chapter 19 when we read the story of Lot, how those two angels came into town in the appearance of men, met Lot, wanted to uh, warn him about the impending destruction because of the rampant homosexuality that was going on in those five cities and in that land. And in that warning, when they came into the town, the men of the city, young and old, as we read, and as you can see in chapter 19, wanted them to be given over to them so that they could have sexual relationship with them. Again, men with men, which is homosexuality. And as we understand and as we know, we will be uh, recognizing through the Word of God how wrong homosexuality is in the eyes of God, who is the true, holy, and righteous God, the Creator and our Savior. And He has the authority alone to determine what is right and what is wrong, and He has set the authority as to what is right and what is wrong. And homosexuality is a sin, just like any other sin, but even more so representing a, a, a willful disobedience to God's will and plan for the human race. So, and actually tonight we're going to talk, I'm going to read a little bit uh, to you in regard to uh, uh, the, uh, the movement of the gay community within our country over the past 25 plus years. But then tonight I'm also going to talk about the right treatment that God has given to us for our sexual relationship inside of marriage and how beautiful that is and what it is designed to do for the human race. So that's what we're going to get into tonight. And tonight's going to be mostly positive aspect of the right sexual relationship that we ought to be entering into. Unfortunately, on Sunday, I have all the negative information, as usual, that I have to give to you. All right. So it's kind of funny how that always comes up. But as we understand, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other four cities with it are a type of the second advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are signs uh, of what will be going on in the society of the day uh, of the second coming of our Lord. In other words, during the tribulational time period, once all believers are, unremoved, uh, are removed from planet Earth, through the rapture, starting with only unbelievers and predominantly unbelievers throughout, but there will be a remnant of Jews that convert instantaneously, 144,000 of them in Genesis chapter 6, and they will be witnessing and evangelizing to the world along with the two great witnesses that come. So many people will come to salvation during the tribulation, but it's going to be ruled by the Antichrist, who is an absolute unbeliever, and he will be ruling along with an unbelieving world in that day, and there will be rampant homosexuality going on uh, in uh, our nation and throughout the world at that time. Again, I, I can't even say our nation because our nation isn't even mentioned during the end times. We're probably going to get wiped out before then, and if we keep going in the trends that we're going in, that could happen very soon. So, in any case, uh, we see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the fire and brimstone raining down upon them. We see the type being the society of what it's going to be in that day, but then the judgment of God's wrath coming against them because of their willful disobedience to God, His will, His word, and His plan. 
So as we've understood, the Jordan Valley is the place of where this great destruction was of Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, you can see Jerusalem and Bethlehem up there more to the north, which is really more central south of uh, the overall nation of Israel. So these were the very par southern parts of the nation of Israel, as it is. And we believe that Sodom and Gomorrah were the down there where the Dead Sea now has probably uh, covered up those cities <coughs> that were totally destroyed. And as we've noted in Genesis chapter 19, it records the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we've read that and noted that uh, story on Tuesday night. And it is caught up in the story of Lot, which is part of the story of Abraham, because Lot was his nephew. And ultimately, uh, uh, he was uh, the head of his family, as his uh, father Haran had passed away earlier. And so Lot was the head of his family in that family line, uh, being now a brother of Abraham, taking over for his father in the family headship. But literally, he was his nephew. Now, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 20, and chapter 19, verse 13, tell us why God would destroy these cities, as we've noted. And in both of those verses, it talks about the outcry of Sodom. And we went over that in detail on Tuesday. And it's not the people that were crying out, repent, 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 or forgive us, God, or save us from this sin. It was sin itself that was crying out to God, that was hurting his ears, as it were, grieving him because of the rampantness of the evil and wickedness that this sin uh, was uh, demonstrating the evil and wickedness within the souls of these individuals and of these people in these cities. And remember in chapter 18, as we noted on Tuesday, Abraham barters with Jesus Christ saying, if they're 50, will you spare it? And he gets all the way down to 10. If there are 10 people in the five cities, five city states, if there's 10 righteous people, which means believers, God said, I won't spare it. And there ended up only being four, maybe even three, Lot and his two daughters. Because remember, the wife escaped, but she turned back and was turned into a pillar of salt. And the two daughters had uh, fiancés. Neither one of them uh, came out with Lot or believed Lot. They, too, were probably unbelievers, most likely. And so, But even if they were, there still weren't another four to six people in five cities that believed and were righteous individuals. The whole society was steeped in this evil and this wickedness. And that's what our country is trying to do to us today, to get the whole society in lockstep in certain types of evil and wickedness that are absolutely counter to the Word of God. And if you go against them, you're the bad person. And I love the word that they use now. You're the racist. You're the hater. You're the one that is wrong, when absolutely we are the ones that are in the right because we are just saying, it's not my thought, it's not my opinion, it's God's opinion. And it's His thought. And He is absolute holy. And He is absolute righteous. And He says, these things are sin, wicked, and evil. And they are a great example of the demonstration of evil and wickedness in the heart, in the souls of people. So, their exceedingly grave sin was that of rampant homosexuality, as we see in Genesis chapter 19, verse 5. And again, uh, in that passage, again, the, uh, the people of the city, men, old and young, wanted to have sexual relationship with the two new guys who came into town, these two angels who took on the appearance of man. And they were demanding that, and they were starting to force and uh, uh, try to beat up Lot so they could get to these two men just to have sex with them. I mean, how pathetic. And Lot even offered his two daughters who were virgins. No, nope, we don't want that. We want the men. Okay? How disgusting. Okay? How disgusting that is. But in any case, uh, exceedingly grave and rampant uh, was the homosexuality. And yet the, uh, the two uh, angels uh, put a blindness on all those men that were trying to get at them so that ultimately they would go away and give uh, Abraham a blessing of having his nephew and his family being able to escape the destruction. So this is going to take us into a mini uh, doctrine, or I could just say principles, in regard to sexual relations as designed by God. 
And as I said, we're going to first read an article that gives us the negative aspect of homosexuality. And it's, I gave it to you in the notes, but I do want to read that to you just so we have it and understand it. But then we're going to get into the positive aspects of God's design for sexual relationship between an adult man and adult woman who are married and the beauty that that brings to the human race. And also the great blessings that it brings to the human race as well, especially those two who are engaged in a right relationship. So in your notes is an article that I uh, uh, found uh, uh, out on a website uh, by, uh, called As in the Days of Lot. And what's interesting is that this was written by a fellow by the name of Earl N. Uh, L. Hen, okay, and he passed away in 1997, and he wrote this article in 1996, 25 years ago. And I didn't include the entire article here, but uh, interesting pieces. But uh, it's interesting that in the entire article, there's even more information about, you know, what had already been accepted back 25 years ago and what they were trying to gain in the future like having legalized marriage between men and men and women and women. Here we fast forward now 25 years later into our day and age, and we have those things in uh, uh, many of the states within our country. And certainly at the federal level, we have laws that at least recognize the civil unions between a man and a man and a woman and a woman, which is a step just below the actual marriage. And, uh, uh, and because of uh, the great wisdom of the framers of our Constitution in our country, they said the federal government can't make these types of decisions. It has to be a state by state by state. And thank God there are still some states that are holding out on these things and not giving over to the pressure of current day politics because if we all went in that direction, absolutely we're going to get wiped out as a nation. I guarantee you, no doubt about it. All right, because we see it time and time again. And I'm going to share with you on Sunday. We talk about Sodom, I'm going to go, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but we talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, but there are two other great examples that we don't even think about much in the Old Testament where God wiped out groups of people because of the rampantness of homosexuality being the demonstration of the evil and wickedness in people's hearts. So as much as people want to say, oh, they're nice and good, as much as they want to look at you know, themselves as peaceful people and use the rainbow for their flag and all this stuff that's a sign of peace and this and that, they're really not peaceful within their heart. They are antagonistic and haters of God. Because if they were lovers of God, they would abide by His Word. And they would apply that. And throughout His Word, Old Testament and New Testament, it is absolutely clear that homosexuality is a sin. And it's in a more egregious sin, especially when it is put out in public and in the open. And when a country adopts it holistically as a normal way of life. It is a representation of the, the rejection of God within their souls. And then uh, well the, uh, I'm going to just give you a little, some other little comments tonight, too. But, you know, what's also interesting is you go around, especially in our area, to most of your, uh, your denominational religions, other than the Catholic Church, okay? And in this geographical lo uh, location, most of the heads of the church, which we would call pastors today, are women. And I would say that 90%, maybe 99% of them are also lesbians as well. So it's a little more than just a woman behind a pulpit, but we see lesbian women behind the pulpit in the church. And you don't think that's egregious against God? That is absolutely egregious against God. And I don't know how they, they, they uh, convince themselves, one, a woman should not be behind the pulpit first and foremost, but number two, you know, a gay lifestyle should not be represented by the church. And where my family grew up in the Episcopalian church, again, which we got out of, you know, over 40 years ago, ultimately they have adopted homosexuality. And uh, I think one of the heads or the bishops of that church are outwardly gay and homosexual. So again, you know, you can't be a Christian and think that ultimately you can purport these types of doctrines and think, oh, everything's fine and everything's wonderful and, and this, that, or the other thing. But in any case, 
Let me read you this article, and you've got it, so you can read along with me as, as you see it. If you don't have the notes, just listen along. It says, It is idiomatic that the dominant characteristics of Sodom's culture was rampant homosexuality. English has borrowed the words sodomy and sodomite to describe homosexuality and those who practice it. When angels came to Lot in the form of human men to inform him that God would overthrow the city, the men of Sodom came to Lot's door, demanding that the visitors come out and have a homosexual relationships with them. Genesis 19, 1 through 5, which we're noting. The angels struck these Sodomites with blindness to drive them away in verse 11. It goes on to say, most people would look upon such behavior as unthinkable. However, again, that was back 25 years ago. Remember, this is 25 years ago. However, the men of Sodom apparently regarded it as normal. They did not view it as an evil at all. Today, a similar attitude is slowly and insistent, insidiously beginning to work its way into our society. Increasingly, homosexuality is considered to be an ordinary lifestyle. Instead of being viewed as a horrible perversion, homosexuality is more and more being regarded as an orientation. Just a left-handedness as an orientation, for example. Or I should say, just as left-handedness is an orientation. It says, as usual, the Western world, and I love what he says, composed primarily of the nations that have descended from Israel, is leading the way in this radical change in attitude. And the reason he puts that in there is because when you go back to the Old Testament and you see how the Israelites who came into, in, into the land, uh, the promised land that God had given them, and God had wiped out all of those who were involved in the false, what we call the phallic cult religions that were all steeped in homosexuality and lesbianism, uh, temple prostitution, he chased them all out and got rid of all those evil pagan uh, religions, got them out of there. But slowly but surely, they all crept their way back into the thought of the Israelite, and the Israelites gave over to these things. And even Solomon bringing in all his wives and allowing them to bring in their religions was a major cause of the paganism that was steeped in homosexuality in the people and nation of Israel. And God had to wipe them out and, and uh, you know, bring them under discipline time and time again. Sometimes they'd rebound and recover and, and repent. Other times they would not. And God would have to bring destruction to them. But time and time again in Israel's history, we see this as, a, uh, as the, the, uh, the marker or the tipping scale or, or the pointer to the evil and wickedness in their heart of the rejection of God, the true God, within their lives. All right, so then the third paragraph, it says, as, oh, excuse me, an article appearing in the January 6th through 12th, 1996 edition of The Economist, entitled It's Normal to be Queer, describes the radical changes in attitude towards homosexuals that has occurred worldwide over the last 30 years. So again, this is 96, going back 30 years. It says, as often happens, the changes have occurred gradually, one step at a time. First, many societies decriminalized homosexuality, and people slowly stopped considering it an illness or perversion. This led many to abandon the traditional view that homosexuality is shameful, opening the door to the idea that gays and lesbians are simply a cultural minority, like a racial or ethnic minority. Finally, some cultures are beginning to regard homosexuality as a normal but different lifestyle, simply an orientation. Of all the items on the gay agenda, none is more important than homosexual marriage. Traditionally, marriage is regarded as a mark of stability and normalcy. State-sanctioned marriage does more than legally bind two people together. It confers upon partners unique rights of inheritance, the sharing of economic and medical benefits, and the guardianship and care of one another. Probably no other single gain could confer upon gays the attributes of normalcy than the right to a civil ceremony legally binding together two people of the same sex in a marriage union. Those behind the gay rights movement are pressing hard to achieve this. Nobody, haven't they accomplished most of that, again, throughout the uh, United States of America, where many states have recognized these things. Then he goes on to say, Andrew Sullivan wrote a book entitled Virtually Normal, An Argument About Homosexuality. A review also published in The Economist clearly outlines the author's conclusion. 
And it says, the core conclusion of the book is simple enough. All discrimination against homosexuals by the state should end, meaning in particular that open homosexuals should be allowed into the armed forces and that they should be allowed a civil ceremony of marriage. Mr. Sullivan's reason, uh, uh, reasons that when homosexuals are revealed as deeply traditional, patriotic, and indeed conservative, there is no reason why society should not embrace them as different but valued parts of the whole. Homosexualities being largely free from the distraction of children which fetter, homose which fetter heterosexuals can become the movers and shakers, in vo the volunteers, the inspiring teachers as needed. Many are all ready. All right, then it goes on to say, here we see an, uh, uh, an avowed homosexual telling us that once the state eliminates all discrimination against gays, and once they obtain the right to marry openly and bear arms, they can then become the leaders and molders of society. Clearly, this is the direction this world is headed. So again, uh, very interesting how that has occurred over the time. Uh, in fact, in the state that we currently live in, Massachusetts, remember, it didn't come to a vote whether we all wanted to have gay and homosexual marriage here in our state. It was a court-ordered rule. One individual decided for the millions and millions of people in our state alone that it was okay. Never came to a vote for the people to say. Now that it's been trending and people are now used to it, they're in the armed services. Remember how all that has gone over the last 20 or 30 years? And first it was, uh, you know, the d don't do, say, don't tell, or whatever the case. All right, then uh, a little more accepted now. Openly, you can do it, and you can't harm these people. You can't do anything to them. You can't say anything. Blah, blah, blah. You know, all of these things to normalize that type of mentality. And now it's an okay thing. And if we had a vote on it today in Massachusetts, I'm sure most people would now say, yeah, that's okay. And they would go along with it, okay, because they've been indoctrinated through this subtle change of Satan and his cosmic system to move the sin nature and the evil and wickedness in this direction. All right, getting back to the article, it says, Many would undoubtedly applaud this push to bring homosexuals out of the closet and allow them to practice their lifestyle openly with the same rights as straight people. Many would argue that this is an enlightened and progressive movement that all, descent, hu that all decent human beings should advocate. But what does God say about this? How does he see and regard homosexuality? Does God advocate gay rights? Let me just pause there, too. And uh, just the other day, um, yeah, uh, I guess uh, in reading an article, uh, one of the articles also quoted our ex-president, Jimmy Carter. You remember Jimmy Carter back in the uh, uh, late 70s and early 80s? Well, supposedly he's this big-time Christian and out there helping the world and helping everybody do this, help everybody do that. Well, he was asked, do you think Jesus Christ would approve of gay marriage? And he said, well, I think he would. I have no scripture to back it up, but I think he would. Because why? They love each other. And as long as there's true love, Jesus must be okay with that. Have you read your Bible, President Carter, ever? All you've got to do is flip to a page or two. You're going to see. And believe you me, go to Romans chapter 1. Okay? Go to the book of Leviticus. Go to the book of Deuteronomy. Go to the book of Exodus. Go to any of the books. Go to the book of Corinthians. You'll see. It ain't so. Okay? Jesus would never ever approve. God would never ever approve of this. And ultimately, what do we see? His absolute disapproval in it by bringing wrath and destruction against the people and nations. Those five cities were states, remember, separate autonomous countries. Destruction against them. He even did it, I'm going to show you on Sunday, against his own people, the Benjamites. He destroyed them because of the rampant homosexuality that was going on in their society that they all were all approving of. So, again, Carter, you're wrong. Okay, You were wrong about a whole bunch of stuff back in the 70s and 80s. This is another one. Okay, You're wrong. Okay, So, in any case, again, wrong mental attitude. And again, I loved how he said, I have no scripture to prove it, but I think he would. Well, whose opinion are we going by? Your opinion? The people's opinion? The world's opinion? 
Or is it God's opinion? How about tell us what God would say? All right. So in any case, there's going to be a lot of sh- if he gets to heaven, there's going to be a lot of shame uh, in the eternal state. So in any case, God sees things quite differently than most people in this world. He clearly states that homosexuality is wrong. It is an abomination of which people must repent. In no uncertain terms, he decrees that homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Now, what we have to also remember is that anybody who believes in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be saved. And there will be homosexuals on earth that make it to heaven. Why? Because they did believe in Jesus Christ. Just as there will be many drunkards in the eternal state, many criminals, murderers in the eternal state. Okay? When he talks about not inheriting the earth, it's like he's talking about those who purport this uh, type of lifestyle, but ultimately never come to believe in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But God was adamant. Again, he said, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Homosexual, homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. And again, uh, you know, any sin can be forgiven. We understand that. We recognize that. This is another sin. But it's another sin that's just a little bit more egregious than uh, many of the other sins because it also tramples all over God's divine institution called marriage between one man and one woman. And ultimately, it has a little bit more uh, uh, evil and wickedness steeped in it. And again, abhorrence in God's eyes and an abomination as we understand. So it says, many thousands of years ago, God knew that this type of movement would occur in the end time among his people. The modern day descendants of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. God thunders a warning to his people today, calling them by a name that unmistakably brands them with the sin of homosexuality. And here he quotes, hear the word of the Lord. You rulers of Sodom, give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. And again, Isaiah was talking to the Israelite people, but he's saying, you people of Sodom, you people of Gomorrah. He's putting them into the categorization of those groups because that's what they were doing too. And again, the the discipline that came against the people of Israel as a result, you can read about in the scriptures also. Then it goes on and on to say, God prophesizes as to where this open acceptance of the homosexual, a- homosexual lifestyle would lead. Then it says, for Jerusalem stumbled and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eye of his glory. They look on their countenance, witnesses against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their soul, for they have brought evil upon themselves, says Isaiah chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. All right, then it says, God reveals that when his people accept the attitude that homosexuality is normal, they have begun to tread the path that will ultimately lead to their destruction. Should I read that again? (laughs) The United States of America? Ultimately lead to their destruction. Again, it's a bell weather or a bell sound or, you know, that, that uh, marker out there in the world that this nation is a state of apostasy. And if we stay in a state of apostasy, God can't bless it any longer. And uh, unfortunately, he's going to have to bring discipline and judgment against it. And if we keep going that route and going that route, eventually it will occur. Now it says, final paragraph, as we see the same conditions that existed in the days of Lot developing today, we can take comfort that the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ is drawing near. So that's a positive aspect. You know, these things have to happen. Jesus prophesied it. Doesn't mean we agree with it. We want to usher it in faster, so go along with it, okay? But it's a bellwether as to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all right? It says, Christ is drawing nearer. It says, when he comes, he will make the Spirit of God available to all in Joel chapter 2. And homosexualities will be taught that they can repent and change. Jesus is described like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, says Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. He will cleanse the earth from all unrighteousness and perversion and show all people how to live 
the way that leads to peace, happiness, and joy. Then and only then will the homosexual lifestyle be eradicated from the earth forever. And again, as Jesus Christ comes back, yeah, the full of soap and the refining fire, he's going to come back in the fire and brimstone of Sodom and Gomorrah, wipe out all the evil of this world, which the homosexuality is a, a great demonstration of, okay? But again, a lot more evils in the world than just homosexuality, as you know. Wipe them all out and then ultimately usher in his millennial reign and eradicate it once and for all time from planet Earth. All right, so that's a great article, again, written 25 years ago. And you can only kind of cringe when you see how much further that movement has progressed and how much even more power they're trying to grab and more influence they're trying to grab. And now going into our schools and into our society where they're teaching elementary children, again, right out of kindergarten, about gender transformation, about the homosexual lifestyle. And again, hate to tell you, you know, and all the racism and everything else that would being bombarded with these days in our country and everything else. But again, what a demonstration of the evil that is coming to our nation. And what a demonstration of the indoctrination of that evil that is happening within our school systems today. And just give that group 10, 15 years. And when they come out, and if they are now fully indoctrinated and this is okay, how much worse is it going to be in 10 or 15 years from now? Again, uh, just uh, evil rampant upon evil, but that also gives us the opportunity to do what? Witness. Witness and evangelize. Bring people to the truth of the knowledge of God. Because they're not going to hear the truth in their schools any longer. They're not going to hear it in their politicians any longer. They need to hear it from the church. And oh, by the way, unfortunately, they're not hearing it from the churches either because they are pastored by gay, homosexual, and lesbian, and pedophile, pedophilic individuals rampantly. So how are they going to teach against what they live and believe each and every day? They're not going to. So again, those who are true believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are adherent to the Word of God, as we all should be, need to be the bellwethers and speak out against it. And even if it's going to cost you something within your life. Again, if this message makes it through Facebook and YouTube, I'll be amazed, okay? I'll be amazed, okay? But again, I think we're small potatoes in a big pond, so I don't think they really care. But in any case... Uh, you know, it's information. If it has to start small, it starts small. Again, the revolution of the United States of America started with one shot in Lexington and Concord, just up the road from here. One shot, okay? And we had a revolution, and we overcame tyranny and evil, all right? So again, we can overcome this and not allow our nation or not just watch passively our nation go under by this, but continue to preach the word, teach the word of God. And again, I'm not adhering to shooting you know, bullets, but I'm adhering to what? Shooting the word of God, preaching the word of God, teaching the word of God. And let the word of God be known so that people can tr have a good understanding of what the truth is and then make a wise decision as to whether they're going to follow the truth or whether they're going to reject the truth. And then, as God says, when they stand before his judgment seat, they will be without excuse. So again, we are the bellwethers of truth, righteousness, and justice. Let's go out and preach the truth, righteousness, and justice uh, from a right place and a biblical place because we have the absolute truth, not the, not the uh, relative truth of today's society, but the absolute truth of the Word of God, who is our Creator and who is our Savior. And on Sunday, I'm going to show you something that is going to absolutely amaze you and once you see that, and then you think that we can be greater than our Creator and our Savior, you're going to be just like, uh, no way, okay? <laughs> and unfortunately, the world doesn't get it. And I think this little video that I'm going to show you on Sunday is going to make you amazed. And again, uh, thank you to uh, Bob of Flint up in upstate New York who passed it along. And something that I've uh, shown in years past, a different, ty a different video, but basically along the same lines. But when you see the immensity of your Creator and Savior, who are we to think that we can come up with our own thoughts and ideas of what true righteousness is? Again, it, it, it is humbling to know 
how insignificant we are on the scale of creation. And who are we to say that our creator, who created all that immensity, doesn't know what he's talking about? So again, unfortunately, it's because they don't believe in him, and they've rejected him, even though they know him and see him through creation. So in any case, uh, this is, takes us now to the positive aspects of our service for the next 15 minutes that we have left, okay? But in any case, the sexual relations designed by God being an absolute good thing. You see, inside uh, the marriage unit, God has designed sexual intercourse to be a wonderful expression of love, intimacy, faith, hope, unity, and privacy as well. And He has designed it, our God who is our Creator and our Savior. He designed sexual relationship. And it began with Adam and the woman back in the Garden of Eden. And when they came out of the Garden of Eden, now they were able to procreate in that sexual relationship and have offspring as well. And that's kind of an interesting thing that struck me today in my studies. Uh, you know, that word procreation, okay? See, procreation. You know what procreation has in the middle of it? Recreation, okay? <laughs> so procreation has recreation. And that recreation means this is fun, this is good, this is relaxing. And this is something to bring you at ease. Something to let it just flow. Like when you go on vacation and you're sitting at a nice warm beach and you're having a wonderful time and all the cares of life just seem to fade away. You see, sexual relationship is designed to bring that to the marriage unit. But unfortunately, because people uh, you know, are, are, are so rejecting that, they're never finding the peace and vacation that sex has uh, uh, been designed to offer them by God when done in a right way. So again, as you know, throughout the Word of God, there are, are right things that can be done. And when we do right things in a right way, it is right. But if you do a right thing in a wrong way, it's still wrong. Okay? You can have sex with a man. You can still have sex. Okay? You can do things. Okay? But it's wrong. But then there's wrong things that can be done in a right way. They're wrong, and certainly a wrong thing in a wrong way is always wrong as well. So in any case, sexual intercourse is a right thing that has been, been designed by God, but done in a right way between one adult man and one adult woman so that love, unity, intimacy, and privacy can be had within that relationship. He designed it, again, between one adult man. You see, I was saying between one man and one woman before, but I also could add one adult man and one adult woman because we also have a lot of pedophilia within our society today where adults are having sexual relationship with children when that is absolutely wrong according to the Word of God. So again, adult man, adult woman. And it's been designed for them to come together in a most intimate relationship as a result of first being married. And we see that all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, the beginning of the Word of God. God brought in what? Sexual relationship between what? A married man and a married woman. And that design has gone throughout history, coming down into Jesus even speaking about it. In Matthew chapter 19 and Mark chapter 10, verses 7 through 8. And then again, Paul reiterating it in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. And so in Ephesians 5, 3, which, uh, 31, I should say, which is a quote from uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 2, it says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined. Now that joined doesn't just mean they're going to hold hands together, okay? Sexual relationship shall be joined with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And again, coming together in one flesh. And, you know, just the simple adage is we say, two, brain, two minds are better than one, right? Two heads are better than one, okay? Two that have come together. Now you've got even a stronger entity as two have now come together. And not only a stronger entity, but also the great provisions that God has designed within that entity for all of that uh, vacation that they can take of the peace and the love and the joy and the unity and the faith and the hope. But it's interesting that Mark chapter 10, verse 9 also says what, right after quoting Genesis 2, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. 
Now, typically we say that at weddings, and we talk about, okay, God has or, or, uh, ordained marriage between one man and one woman, and let's not have divorce, okay? But we also see in the Old Testament God giving reasons for, dis- for divorce, and so divorce is okay, not that God wants it to be, but divorce is okay, according to the Word of God, if done for the right reason. What's the main reason for a right reason for divorce? Sexual immorality, as we've taught over the last couple of months, at any level. And Sunday we're going to go through the various types of uh, sinful sexual immorality. So, in any case, what therefore God is joined together, let no man separate. What this also is telling us, more than just, you know, let's not have divorce, but what God has designed, let no man destroy. What did God design? Marriage. And in the marriage, we see in Genesis chapter 2 and reiterated in Mark 10 and also Ephesians 5.31, what? That the two are joined together in sexual relationship for a specific reason. And let no man separate. In other words, let, let, let no man determine what marriage should be and what right sexual relationship should be. So it's more than just divorce here that God is telling us. We are to determine what a right marriage is. It's not up to man to say a man can marry a man or a woman can marry a woman. Okay? And why can't I marry my dog or my turtle or my, you know, my frog in the backyard that's my favorite pet? Why can't I marry them and give all my inheritance to them? Well, because there's another thing called bestiality that God says is wrong, too. So, again, that would be out as well. But in any case, you know, what, who is man to determine what marriage should be and what a right sexual relationship is? You see, we have no right to determine that. We have no authority to determine that. Only God has the determination for that, and he's determined And he's given it to us, and he's told us what is right, and he's also strongly told us what is wrong. And so again, let no man put asunder, as we like to say. What God has joined together, let no man separate. Let no man define what right sexual relationship is and what marriage should be. God is the definer because he is the author and perfecter of it, and he's done it for a specific reason. And as you know, it all has to do with the angelic conflict, And that's why the days of Noah were a sign of the second coming of the Lord because we had fallen angelic creatures having sexual relationship with human women and how that was wrong. So God had to wipe out that and destroy the strange flesh sexual relationship of that day. Now we see Sodom and Gomorrah with men having sex with men and that too being a form of strange flesh. God had to wipe that out as a sign and as a symbol. And it worked for a couple thousand years, okay? But again, history tends to repeat itself because we don't learn from our past. And sin and evil perpetuate in the next generation and the next generation. And isn't it interesting today that our society is trying to get us to erase what our history in the United States of America has been? Oh, why do you think that? Well, if you erase the history, you can make new rules. If you get rid of the Constitution, you can make new rules. And we can make rules according to our standard, what we want to do, and basically to live our sinful lives. Really, that's what it's all about, and to have our power, our evil, and our wickedness the way we want it. We don't want to have a standard of God within our lives. We want to do away with it. And part of the Communist Manifesto, which, again, the homosexual, uh, gay and homosexual community and uh, lesbian and transgenders and all the other things that go along with that have also incorporated Let's use that Communist Manifesto. And let's look at those little lists. And you can look it up anywhere. Look at the Communist Manifesto and the steps they take to change a society that is free down to communism, which ultimately results in slavery. You may not think it, but it does. Okay, And ultimately, it uh, works it all the way down there. And to be enslaved, maybe you're not going to be in whips and chains, but you're going to be enslaved to a lifestyle, a mental attitude, an evil that you have to abide by. Otherwise, you won't be able to survive or live in the society. So again, trying to change our country over is part of that communist manifesto. And that is about what? Getting rid of the past history. Trying to take names of 
George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and all these off of schools and let's change our history and let's you know rewrite what the founders wrote and you know uh, change the Constitution and uh, uh, the courts and the law systems and all these things let's change it all so it fits our little agenda and again the agenda of those who currently are in power and again that is all about the evil and wickedness that Satan has brought into the world. And, you know, right there is the Communist Manifesto that also is is uh, been led by the homosexuality and gay community so that ultimately they can have their freedom of openness of their type of lifestyle. But again, in God's eyes, it is an abomination. So when we talk about the right relationship in marriage, and again, stealing this from uh, the late uh, R.B. Theme, Colonel Theme, uh, Jr., Basically, he had this illustration of the marriage being like a castle. And in that castle, first you have to create a foundation. And in that foundation, who is the better foundation than anything else but the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And then upon that, you build a structure. And that structure of a castle, again, back in the day, was designed to fortify, to give protection, uh, uh, privacy, and peace, unity, of those who are inside the castle and keeping out all wicked and evil that is trying to penetrate. So again, he uses this example of a marriage being a castle and the sexual relationship between a right man and a right woman, again, one man and one woman, being that castle that God has designed in the marriage to fortify the relationship between the husband and the wife. And so that's what sexual, right, what sexual relationship does. It actually enhances life for the husband and for the wife and for all of society as well. Because if all of society is having protection and enhancement in their life, again, the whole society is going to be better and be more at peace. So first and foremost, as I've noted, the foundation of the castle is what? Bible doctrine resident in the soul. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 2.16 says, you know, we have the mind of Christ. And you see, to build and fortify any relationship, it really needs to be based on what? The Word of God, Bible doctrine. You see, Jesus Christ isn't here. He left 2,000 years ago. But yet, He is still here in His indwelling ministry. But more importantly, or just as importantly, I should say, His Word is here. You see, the Bible is the mind of Christ. And so we can understand what the foundation that gives us strength in life is when we know the Word of God. And in that, the one flesh that it talks about, the husband and wife coming together as one flesh, that def defines uh, an invisible wall that is put up inside the marriage union. You see, when husbands and wives come together in that great coalescence of a sexual relationship, it actually fortifies each of them and gives them a better relationship with uh, each other, but then also in compared to uh, others within society and helps them overall within their life. You see, next, after building up the, uh, uh, you know, the, the invisible walls, which the sexual relationship brings, we also have a thing called personal love. Having a personal love between a right man and a right woman where they love each other personally, that builds a great structure because now what? They've got each other's back. They're going to protect each other. They're going to have privacy. They're going to have uh, freedom. And they're going to have a great relationship with each other that insulates them and protects them from the evils that are out there in the world. And the husband will protect the wife, and the wife will protect the husband. So, again, in this castle structure, it starts with the foundation of the Word of God, the mind of Christ resident within your soul, and then the whole relationship of personal love and sexual relationship that God gives to us builds that relationship and fortifies it so that ultimately it is a fantastic one. And with that, it provides unity, privacy, intimacy, love, affection, and virtue. And again, two heads are better than one. And how many times have you been in a relationship where, you know, uh, maybe your husband's going off and you give him an elbow and say, hey, you know, stop it, knock it off. Or maybe the wife's going off and you give her an elbow, hey, stop it, knock it off, okay? So you don't allow them to continue to enter into that sin or a sinful lifestyle. You see, that's what the husband and wife should be doing for each other. There's a unity there. They're stronger together as one. There's privacy. Nobody needs to know our business because it's our business and no one else needs to know it. Intimacy, 
Certainly there should be a loving relationship where you just have a freeing of yourself, where you can give of yourself freely to the other partner and understand and recognize uh, you know, the relationship that you have and the love and affection that goes along with it that also leads to virtue, again, righteousness and justice, that also leads to happiness. You see, having sexual relationship in a right way gives you all these things, and God has designed it to do exactly that. You see, for the woman, the wall of protection for her is from any encroachment from the outside world where someone may come to try to seduce her, distract her, maybe interfere uh, with her affections, or even having her admire some other man that will lead her astray and ultimately destroy her relationship with her right man or her right woman. So the husband in that relationship is designed to have a great relationship with her so that her mind doesn't wander and that no one can come in and ultimately steal her away as it was. All right? See, that's what the husband needs to do. He needs to protect his wife. And when the husband and wife have a beautiful sexual relationship, as they should, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm not going to have time enough tonight to get into all the details, so I guess we'll do some fun stuff on Sunday as well. But uh, ultimately, when they have a good sexual relationship, it stops them from looking elsewhere. And again, we could get into pornography and all the things that are going on in our society today that it's so easy to get. You see, back in the ancient day, they had uh, uh, a false god worships called the phallic cult, and a phallic is the human sexual organ, and they would worship that, and they would worship sex. There were male prostitutes, female prostitutes. And when you went to church, it was about having sex with someone else. How fun is that? Okay. Well, from a physical standpoint, it probably was a lot of fun. Okay. But from a mental aspect, it was detrimental to their soul. And that's why God had to destroy it and wipe them out time and time again. But inside the right relationship between a husband and wife, it is designed so that ultimately they feel fulfilled in all aspects of their life. And the sex that they can have inside that relationship is part of that fulfillment process. And personal love is the mechanic for the husband to protect his wife, as he should, by fulfilling her needs and her desires. So ultimately she doesn't have to wander or also protect her from other men coming in to try to seduce her away and say, hey, I got something better for you. I got something great for you. Just come along with me. So in Ephesians chapter 5, 25, husbands love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself as a substitute for her. Okay? What did Jesus do? He gave his life for the church. What should husbands do? Give their lives for their wife exactly what they should be doing in all aspects. And if it comes to the literal aspect of giving their lives, then so be it. That's what they should do. But the mainstay of this is all of their uh, efforts, all of their thoughts, everything that they are doing should be in a, a design of protecting the wife and providing for the wife throughout her entire life. At the same time, the wife is commanded throughout Scripture to respect her husband. And when she is to respect her husband, she recognizes his needs, his desires, and ultimately fulfills them for him. So his needs and desires don't go unfulfilled, and where he has to then wander lustfully and look somewhere else for the fulfillment of those things. You see, the wife is supposed to be doing that inside the marriage. You see, the invisible walls of protection inside of marriage is sexuality, which was invented by God, and it is to be the monopoly of marriage between a man and a woman, an adult man and an adult woman, and only that. You see, sexual relationships should not be outside of marriage, even between a man and a woman. It should not be between a man and a man, a woman and a woman, or a man and an animal, okay? Or, a, or an adult and a child. None of that should be the case. And again, the Word of God speaks boldly against all of those things, but it speaks rightly about sexual relationship between a husband and a wife as it should be. And let me just leave you with this tonight, and then we'll uh, get into some more of this on uh, a Sunday morning. Sex is the castle walls that isolates the husband and wife from all other persons in the periphery. 
You know, there's an intimacy that happens. I mean, you know, this is just the example. But the husband and wife are able to share thoughts and opinions and uh, everything in life that no one else needs to know or be part of, all right? There's a intimacy because the two are one. And in regard to the sexual relationship, it brings them together so that ultimately they can have that unity, they have that privacy, that intimacy, that love, and all that goes along that's part of the divine institution, number two, called marriage. So when the husband and wife come together, it's a great sharing of each other, but also, you know, think how vulnerable people are when they are in that relationship as well. And again, but you don't care because now you're free. And as I'm going to show you on Sunday and speak to it, it's like going back to the Garden of Eden. Remember, they were naked all the time, right? And when you have sex, again, most of the time you're naked completely. But you're free about it. It's okay. You're not uptight. You wouldn't walk around the streets naked, would you? No, you wouldn't. Well, some people would. I know the streaking and all that stuff. All right? But again, inside the sexual relationship, you're free. And you're not afraid about who's going to see you and what's going to be and this and that and the other thing. And you are totally uh, uh, relaxed. It's like you've gone back to the Garden of Eden. And so therefore... God has designed it in such a way to give us that peace, that joy, that happiness, that freedom, giving us a vacation from our everyday lives so that ultimately we can have that type of uh, intimacy and happiness and joy within that relationship. And when we do, again, it really solves a lot of the other problems that can come in life. And there's a lot of things that we just put by the wayside and say, no, it's not that, that important. And you know, maybe you got to deal with it. Maybe there's a bill that you got to pay, or maybe there's something that's got to come up, a child you got to reprimand, or whatever. But for that moment, you're free, and your mind is nowhere else but right where you are. And you've been given peace and joy and happiness in that time and in that moment. And that moment can carry over where now the problems of life don't seem to be as difficult or tumultuous as maybe you thought they were prior to that. So again, it's a great thing that God has designed between a husband and wife to really give them a strong relationship, just as God has designed an opportunity for all of us to have a very strong relationship with Him and His Son, Jesus Christ, when we have His Word resonant within our soul. All right, so uh, we'll leave it off there, and uh, we'll get back to it on Sunday morning, and then uh, get into some of the negative aspects of uh, wrong sexual relationships uh, when we come back. All right, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the beauty that you've given to us and the freedom and the prosperity uh, that you've provided through the sexual relationship of a husband and wife. And Father, we just thank you for your great design, and we ask that you lead us to honor it. And if we've ever dishonored it, Father, we confess that to you and ask that you lead us in the right direction so that ultimately we walk in your will and in your plan, glorifying you each and every day. Father, we ask for your travel blessings on our way home this day. In Christ's name, amen.